I'd like to welcome to the stage Michelle Lauder from the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources, Kylie Jonason from the Department of the Environment and Energy, Paul Smith from the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, Terry Hubbard from the National Land Care Network, and Hannah Maloney from Good Life Permaculture. By way of a, a background, the community land care movement has been active for over three decades in a variety of forms, becoming a nationwide community driven movement and in 1989 with the launch of the Decade of Land Care to address land degradation at the grassroots level. The movement itself is ever changing. It's inclusive of junior land care, coast care, friends of groups with some land care groups evolving into farming systems groups or morphed into other organisations and there's many others. In a time of increasing resource constraints, rapidly evolving technology, new land uses, industries and community views, ever increasing threats to productivity and conservation, it is time to rethink what we want land care to be and to achieve into the future. How will we engage with climate change, the management of pests and diseases, land use change, while embracing younger generations of people interested in being involved and making a difference. It's said that the only constant is change. 30 years means generational change. Is land care continually evolving and adapting? Is it keeping up with the times? What can the movement do now to ensure that land care has a strong and vibrant future? All this and more the panel will discuss in the context of where to from here for land care. Terry, do you want to start? No. That's very kind. Do I need to go to the pulpit? <laughs> oh, do you want to go to the pulpit? Uh, I'm quite happy to sit here if that's you might okay. Come over there, so it's right. cash. My four minutes starts now. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Given the fiscal restraints imposed on land care and the requirements that under the National Land Care Program, land care will work with other organisations within the natural resource management sector, I think this topic is timely. First, let me say that at the group level of land care, there still prevails a strong, committed, voluntary workforce whose driving motivation, motivation is to leave their land and environs in a better state than when they found it. This driving force, coupled with the attendant social value of community land care, is in many places the glue that binds small communities together. It is the morale booster, the quick responder to crises, the deliverer of significant cost-effective outcomes in environmental repair, and the initiator of best farm management practices. And it's been there for the long haul. And yet the land care movement takes regular funding hits which over the past 10 years or so have been delivered by both sides of politics. The programs which, programs which shift em emphasis don't involve local input and which require delivery within tight election uh, timeframes, cycle timeframes, continue to frustrate the movement. A logical response to this frustration has been the emergence of adv advocacy support groups in the form of state and territory peak representative bodies who, as members of the National Land Care Network, are able to argue for the support of land care and to put the case for a land care presence at decision-making tables. The past two years has seen a marked improvement in relations be between our key partners, LAL, and the National, um, sorry, the Australian peak bodies of NRMs. Uh, and I've lost it as usual. We, rec we recognise the value of combining our collective resources to present the compelling case for ongoing and increased support to maximise the value that every dollar invested delivers. A united approach, putting the value proposition for increased support for natural resource management will carry more weight within, uh, uh, than with individual approaches. The future, which is really what we're here today about, 
Many land care initiated programs are now aiming at our young people. Schools, environmental curricula are commonplace now and are being complemented and reinforced with remarkable initiatives such as the Kids Teaching Kids programs. We are often referred to as an ageing population, which cannot attract young people to embrace land care, but it is not all gloom and doom. I see evidence of renewal in my own land care group as new members to our community seek advice and connections as properties change hands. And there is a shift to engaging young people. And while there is much to do in this space, I would cite Intrepid Land Care, which got a mention last night at the awards, as a classic example of how young people view land care, how they tweak it to suit their own needs and how they are receptive to mentoring. Intrepid is a growing organisation and there are similar like bodies as well. Two members of that organisation already have a presence on uh, boards in New South Wales and uh, Queensland. And it is likely that other peak bodies will see the value of this in time. The National Land Care Network has indicated to the federal government the need for support of youth-led initiatives in the land care space, and this is an ongoing discussion. In Victoria, and more recently in, in New South Wales, land care has benefited markedly from the state government-funded land care facilitators initiative. These young people with fresh ideas and advanced communication skills play a vital role in reinvigorating we older folk and attracting new members to land care with the wide variety of attractions they offer. So in summation, the future of land care very much rests in our hands. The emergence of the peak representative bodies is a key element in determining our future direction. We need to nurture our young people through the schools programs and into that next space currently being pop populated by Intrepid. These young people are naturally concerned with world attitudes to environmental threats and they have the communication tools and the will to act. And that's awesome to use one of their favourite expressions. <laughs> we need governments at state and federal levels to acknowledge that Australia faces significant challenges if we do not act expeditiously to mitigate against the effects of global warming and climate variability. Doing little or nothing is not an option. Governments need to understand that Landcare presents governments with quick response strike teams to deliver morale building, practical, restorative help to those affected by crises, in addition to its well recognised, dedicated commitment to our natural environment. It needs to be properly resourced. The collaboration of all players in the environmental space is vital if we're to be able to speak with one voice to our funders, to argue the compelling case for ongoing, preferably bipartisan support and recognition of the need to support this large, most cost-effective voluntary environmental workforce that we are. Finally, no one should under, underestimate the enormous contribution Landcare increasingly makes to community well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Today, um, I've been asked to talk about youth engagement in the context of the future of land care, and I'm talking about it in the context of agriculture, that's my personal area of um, expertise. And I'm also focusing on it because, as we've heard a few times, over half of Australia is under agriculture. And so, if we can get that right, we actually address a whole other set of issues. And I also want to acknowledge that. Good agriculture uh, integrates natural systems on the land and in the water. And so it's very holistic and integrated. So we're addressing everything ultimately, whether that's on the land or in social systems. Uh, I have uh, observed three key challenges to youth engagement in agriculture over the past decade or so. The first one is access to land. And that's a no-brainer in today's uh, uh, real estate market. If you haven't been raised on a farm where you don't inherit land, trying to crack into that and buy something without going into crippling debt is almost impossible. It is so hard. And then if you do do that and then have to go and buy all the infrastructure required to do the farming that you want to do, well, you know, again, it's, you're really putting yourself out there on a limb. Major, major barrier. Uh, the second uh, barrier I've uh, observed is access to appropriate training. 
there, we have a lot of great training, uh, formal and informal training opportunities. Uh, uh, but as someone who enrolled in the ag science degree, not once, I think maybe two or three times, and I think the longest I lasted was two hours, and I apologise. <laughs> it was a really good course. But as, it was blatantly obvious to me, uh, I went as a mature age student in my mid-twenties, um, I got there and went, oh, you're not going to teach me how to respond to climate change, you're not going to teach me about how to build good soil, and you're not going to teach me about my water systems. And uh, in recent years, when I actually teach a lot of uh, people about soil health and composting basics, uh, I get lots of people who've just freshly graduated from ag science degrees who've never learned anything about how to build good soil food web or good compost. And that's mind-blowing for me. So good, appropriate training is a, is a gap. The third challenge uh, is a bit, uh, bit more invisible. It's a, I call it the culture of our food system. It is a heavily regulated food system. And regulations are good, by the way. We need them to keep us on our game and to keep things safe and clean. But we don't need them to be crippling uh, and make it, making it harder, especially for small farms or family farms. This can be really, really tough work. And also, the culture of our food system is driven by global economics rather than local resilience and social and environmental health. There are many, many things we can un in unpack there. Uh, but that it does not inspire a vibrant food culture. Uh, it doesn't inspire people to uh, be attracted to going, yeah, I'm going to be a farmer. It's so easy and I've got so much support. Like, this government's really got my back. It's like, actually, being a farmer, you have to be your everything and you have to really be able to back yourself. And, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you, farmers are bloody amazing people, multi-talented people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so... I have, some, I have some ideas and solutions. I think about them a lot. I talk to, about, to people about them a lot. Access to land. So people are getting more and more creative today about how to access land without having to actually buy it. Uh, you can have long-term lease arrangements on private or business or government land. Uh, uh, in Hobart, we've set up the Hobart City Farm, which is a long-term lease arrangement on state government land for a peppercorn lease on other, otherwise underutilised urban space. Uh, which is very abundant, more so in some cities than others, but it is there and it is present. Um, in the rural scenarios, you're seeing uh, more, increasingly more hobby farmers or lifestylers who have significant portions of land, and people can have long-term leases uh, to help uh, manage that land productively, and it's a win-win scenario there. Uh, there's so many great uh, examples of agricultural-based land trusts we can uh, protect fertile soils from being built on and uh, protect them for forever so they can be productive and sustain us forever, which is, which is really great. Uh, moving on to access to appropriate training and, and possible solutions. Uh, we heard yesterday from the very wonderful Major General, the Honourable Michael Jeffrey, and he was talking about um, good training starts from school gardens, and I wholeheartedly back that. I've worked a lot in school gardens. Um, anybody else who's worked in that space will notice, though, that as soon as you graduate from primary school to high school, school gardens stop. <laughs> and the messaging with that is that school gardens are lovely and fun, but they're not a viable uh, career for you. That's the invisible message that people pick up on, I personally believe. And wouldn't it be great if school gardens were integrated, as uh, Michael Jeffrey mentioned, all the way through um, to grade 12? Uh, and wouldn't it be fantastically awesome if there were urban and rural agrarian training hubs where people could go to to get on-the-ground practical skills to back up theory and learn theory? Um, in urban centres, this could look like market gardens, uh, where it's really viable to have half an acre or a number of quarter-acre sites uh, to learn the fine arts of market gardening or small-scale livestock keeping. And, and similarly, in a rural context, wouldn't it be amazing if you could go to established and ideally mature systems showcasing holistic management, silver pastures, integrating livestock and tree cropping, uh, passive water harvesting, I can go on. But wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to sit at uni lecturer, similar to this, for three years and learn about it on a PowerPoint, and you can go and learn appropriate, relevant information for your context? I would have just, just loved that 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I've almost finished. The solutions for the culture of our food system, well, that's a big one, and I think Michael Jeffries really 
uh, nailed it on a high level. We, need, we do need that national uh, soil policy, I believe, and Costa, you nailed it when we said the Ministry of Soil and Compost, also highly critical. Um, Michael Jeffries mentioned uh, having strategic national assets of the soil, water and vegetation. It's bang on, I can't, I can't fault that. Um, we need it on multi, multiple levels though, so on a grassroots level, you're seeing people to self-organise, um, to come together as farmers, as producers, to, to connect and share information and to um, uh, help each other basically uh, get across those regulations that can cripple and put people out of business uh, and share those skills and experiences to um, uh, accelerate uh, their livelihoods being viable and long-term and forever. And that's about, it's so, so much of that's about regulations currently. And of course, like, I, I, what should I say? I think that we have everything we need right now to respond to the massive issues that we're facing. That includes climate change, regulations, etc. I think land care has a really amazing uh, uh, origins in farming, an incredible three decades full of great uh, implementation. And then moving into the future, we have got these, these some really obvious gaps, which I've just outlined, and we've got some amazing opportunities for land care to collaborate with other uh, community individuals, groups, partners, etc., to fill them. And wouldn't that be amazing to see um, those agrarian hubs? I'm just going to keep saying agrarian educational hubs. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's come down to the senior bureaucrat to talk about the importance of integration, so uh, strap yourselves back for this. But the thing is, Landcare has been an integrating uh, force for 30 years, and I, I know this because as an undergraduate student, I was taken by my uh, lecturer in a clapped-out minibus, and we went for a couple of hour drive up the highway into the landscape, and we, we met with uh, Sharman Stone and a few of the locals who had decided that a number of prof propositions of integration were superior propositions than, than working separately in a carved up landscape. Um, so the propositions were, and they, they really are a story about integration, and I'll use this as a way of layering through to what do we do for the next 30 years. The proposition being that land is managed best at a landscape level, and that individual parcels are not the right media through which to look at the issues that we need to deal with. Second of all, that people in that landscape working together rather than separately will ultimately get a better outcome for themselves, for their land and for the environment. So those two propositions, uh, back when uh, this was all being sort of thought through at the local level, those two, we could have asked Aboriginal people, they would have told us day one that that was probably a great idea to begin with, but maybe we're slow learners, we got to that point after about 200 years. The point being that people in the landscape working together, cooperating, actually come up with much, much better solutions. Following that, the activities, the programs, the work that we do from a government, a government perspective, the way we fund things, how it works a whole lot better if we work out and design those programs in a way that actually complements each other, that we get our weeds program, our, our what was called noxious weeds and vermin programs, that we get our uh, salinity programs, we get our water quality programs, we get our riparian management, our native veg, we get all that stuff to work together, rather than funding it all and doing it all separately. We plan it all together to make it work better. The next proposition is, well, why don't we get the institutions to actually work together? So rather than having all separate bits like salinity boards, land conservation boards, we might have other trusts and all the little bits and pieces across the landscape, how about we put all that together and cause institutional change to make a better outcome? So we create things like CMAs, we create higher level, broader scale institutional arrangements that actually support the local work going on. Uh, that, that actually means that we get coherent outcomes for money spent, whether it's individual effort or government funding. So that's a more sensible way, and we ended up with total catchment management and integrated catchment management. Those things, those terms have been lost a little bit over time, but I think if that's fundamentally what we're all talking about here. Um, those individuals working as groups, working as networks of groups, the scale goes up and the benefits go up as well. 
Eventually, we got supporting legal frameworks. We didn't have separate legal frameworks. We brought things together into integrated legal frameworks, integrated policy frameworks. And then, ultimately, what are the regulatory sanctions and incentive schemes that work across a landscape to get better outcomes in one direction rather than another? So the final piece of integration has been a challenging one to get in from local, regional, state level to national integration. That is a always a challenge because you enter into the political sphere as well. So firstly, what do you learn about that? Well, that only took 30 years. Um, and uh, you know, we, we could, with the benefit of hindsight, have come to a better landing um, out of all of that from 30 years of learning. What we now have, we have the insight of that 30 years to design our future for the next 30 years. Um, what caused that was individual people getting the ball rolling. It wasn't the top-down stuff. So it wasn't uh, governments and laws that made all of those things happen. It was actually individual people at place making a decision that things could be better if they worked together. That things can be better if we actually make things uh, to, to put uh, our actions in place in an integrated way. So what does that mean? Uh, people will lead and our leaders need to follow. That's what has happened over 30 years. People have led locally and leaders have followed that. So where do we go from here? I, I do think we're at risk of missing an opportunity. We have the benefit of the hindsight now of 30 years to set ourselves up for another 30 years and it's cost to put the challenge down last night, 300 years. Uh, it will only come from, however, not top-down stuff. It won't come from the government deciding how the next 30 years is going to happen. It's not going to come from that. It'll come from individuals. It'll come from the local level. The basic proposition that people in the landscape working together will get the next 30 years nutted out pretty much. So how do we actually make that happen? We know a lot's changed. We have different farming practices, we have different agricultural practices, we have different communities, we have a generational change at work, we have diversified economies, we have a diverse, diversified community, uh, we have, uh, in spite of what you know, the, the, the media like to pick up, various views being put forward by politicians, we actually have a multicultural community, we actually have a very long indigenous history. So how do we make those those uh, qualities that we have, that diversification in our social fabric, how do we use that to our best effect to get another 30 years of land care uh, to be successful? Uh, so our challenge is to, again, listen to the, the land and our people in that land, but the people in the land are a whole lot different now. Um, our challenge, in my mind, is reconciling the current picture of the diversification that we've experienced uh, reconciling our Aboriginal history and the knowledge that Aboriginal people can bring to landscape management and bringing in the various cultural experiences that will offer us at whatever age, whatever gender, offer us the best solution going forward. Because I think in history we look back and see this as very much um, a, a white person's more conservative part of um, you know, the, the spectrum doing land management in a cooperative sense, then what do we do now with a much larger population, culturally, linguistically diverse population, and a population with a very strong need to understand its, and reconcile its history with its Aboriginal uh, partners? So I think that if we can do those things, that will set us up for that 300-year future. Um, G'day, I'm Kylie. Before I start, I would like to um, acknowledge the people on whose land we're meeting, the Kulam Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, blessing and a curse going after these three, because what else can I say? <laughs> I've got these lovely notes that my guys wrote for me, um, but it's all been said. So I'm going to emphasise some points that have already been said, frankly. Um, the first thing is collaboration. I think the strength of land care is in the partnerships and the collaboration in the local on-ground communities. 
and I'm really pleased to hear some of Terry's comments earlier about that, the, the collaboration that's really starting to come through. Um, you know, I guess I'm, you know, I'm, the gov I'm also senior government representative, so I'm bound to mention the money thing that Terry also identified. We all know that it's a scarce resource and it's getting a bit scarcer. Um, what can we do to convince governments that we need to continue to invest in these things? They're, we know they're very important. We're preaching to the converted in this room. So how do we translate that message into something that our masters and, and my minister um, can understand, I think is really critically important. Some of that comes down to the tension that I, that I observe, I guess, um, and it's a natural constant tension between um, development and economic prosperity and, and preservation and conservation and, and ensuring a sustainable future for our land and our land-based, um, um, I guess, activities. I don't think it needs to be a competition. I think we've heard, again, some really interesting things and I was just blown away by some of the, some of the things that people um, that were nominated for awards last night are doing. It's, you know, I come to these things all the time and I learn every single time. You know, you guys are just incredible. Um, so how do, how do we capture some of that knowledge that's really on-ground local knowledge and translate that into stuff that's really uh, meaningful and tangible for, for our politicians and our ministers to understand so that they can translate, translate that into, into an ongoing 300-year commitment? Wouldn't that be awesome? I think a, any, there's not a, not a bureaucrat that wouldn't love a 300-year commitment, um, funding commitment, make our lives a hell of a lot easier. Um, I think... The, the other thing um, that's been mentioned is the connection with youth. And I, again, so excited. I haven't had the opportunity to meet anyone yet from the Intrepid group, but I'm really, really keen to do that. And so excited to see so many young people engaged. Absolutely acknowledge some of the challenges that Hannah identified about how you connect in and, and get involved. Um, I visited a farm in, in South Australia a few months back and. Um, you know, I was talking with, with a woman who is, is doing some really incredible things on her farm, probably things that you guys all know about and, and do really well, but were really impressive to me, not being a farmer. Um, but I, I, and she said, oh, the young bloke across the road, I said, well, how do you convince him to do some things? And she said, oh, the young bloke across the road. And I said, well, how old is he? And she said, oh, 60. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like, okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, really, how do we, how do we connect into the, the real youth? <laughs> Sorry, 60-year-olds, but I mean, how do we connect into the real youth? How do we make that, that tangible connection and get people inspired and engaged? I think um, I was at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in Honolulu recently for two weeks, and that was amazing. Um, and there was, a, there was a fellow there that said, um, and I won't get his words right, but he said when he was in his 20s, he could change the world. When he was in his 30s, um, well, he'd have a shot at, at the country that he was living in. When he was in his 40s, well, he might go for the state in the local area. When he was in his 50s, he was focused on his family and, and a couple of mates. And when he was in his 60s, he'd run out of ideas. So, you know, and that really resonated with me. We have to capture that enthusiasm. We've got to find a way to connect and, and bring people in and learn from that. Um, social media. Costa said it. I've heard it so many times. Um, our ministers are learning how to use it. So how can we help them learn how to use it so that they can learn more about what we do? You know, we, we're the ones that give them the messages and, and, and help them with some of the, the information that gets out there. So how can I capture what you're doing and get that onto my minister's social media page and get him engaged and captured in that stuff? How can I get him out to visit things? Um, I think I'm going to stop there because I, I'd rather hear about you guys and hear questions from you guys. Um, I think we've got a real, we do have a really exciting time. We are doing a review of the National Land Care Program. We've done heaps of plugs for the survey, so I'm going to plug it again. Please do the survey, fill in the survey, get your friends, neighbours, people that aren't at this conference to fill in the survey. Again, I know you, I'm preaching to the converted, so I'd really like to hear from people that aren't involved in land care. You know, when you go back, when you go home, talk to the blokes in your community and the people in your community and the kids in your schools. Get them to fill in the survey. I want to know what other people think, not people that are just in, in, the, um, in the industry, so to speak. Um, but, yeah, I'd like to hear from you and um, hopefully get some challenging questions that I can pass to my colleagues. Um, so I'll hand over to Michelle. Thank you. Um, as we all know, Landcare is unique in so many ways. 
It's the grassroots movement. It's about community action and making a difference. It focuses on natural resource management, bringing together sustainable agriculture and productivity with protecting and rehabilitating the environment. It's uh, one of the most recognised brands in Australia. And some of the innovations that have been trialled, shared and adopted through Landcare have led to significant practice changes. Things like minimum and no-till, retained stubble, fencing off stock from waterways and veg native vegetation, ground cover targets, etc. Today, we keep hearing there's over 5,400 groups involved in Landcare, over 11,000 schools involved in Landcare, and that doesn't include all the hundreds of thousands of individuals that practice land care on their property, in their community, donating funds, turning up to events, etc., etc. So many are involved. Do you remember when computers were as big as a house and costed billions of dollars? Now you've got one in your pocket. Look, Terry's got one in his pocket. <laughs> um, you know, that can drive your tractor and manage your bank accounts. Remember when a drone was something that delivered boredom? Now it delivers real-time information feeds from your property to enhance productivity and maximise profitability. Remember when no-till farming was a new concept? Today, adoption is near 90% in some districts. While we hear it regularly, change really is the only constant in today's world. And whether we like it or not, this applies to everyone and everything, including land care. Land care, like everything and everyone else, needs to evolve, needs to move with the times. This is not so much about changing what Landcare does, but how it does it. From the beginning, Landcare was a grassroots movement focusing on the needs of the local landscape and the local community, and that continues on. There are new communities making Australia their home. There are people moving to new communities all the time. Is Landcare taking advantage of those opportunities? These people often want to connect with the local community and learn about the local issues. What is the community interested in that you can link to land care in your region? I recently heard from Karangamite CMA that they've been um, working with the pony clubs. These are full of so many young people and their parents that are involved and deeply care about horses. It's not a big leap to engage them in land care. And we've heard a lot from a lot of the panel about engaging with youth, you know, and, and there's big opportunities there. Um, I, I read a, a survey recently that was saying just in the last 12 months, 30% of millennials, so people between 18 and 34, have volunteered, you know, and, and they have plans to continue volunteering in the next 12 months. We, we are also busy and we always hear about, you know, different parts of the population that are too busy to get involved in land care. But it's not one size fits all. There's people that want to get involved and, and want to help and want to do things to make a difference. And then there's other people that this is not the right time in their life, they need to do it later. I, I do know Landcare is changing. I remember being at the 2012 National Landcare Conference and one of the large focuses was teaching us, teaching the, the people that came to the conference about social media, how to use Twitter, how to use Facebook. And now you can follow so many Landcare groups through social media and that's been a big change just in the last four years. Funding support, as we keep hearing from everyone, is becoming increasingly difficult to obtain with increasing demands at the government, corporate and philanthropic sectors. There's not enough funding for every important issue and cause. So work's required to provide a prospective funder with what's the value proposition for them. Why should they fund you? How is it to their advantage? How does Landcare help achieve their goals? Is it going to be a good news story for them or are there going to be complaints about who missed out? These things all need to be considered. So what are the opportunities for Landcare? Funding, I know a number of groups have been um, using crowdsourcing. Um, fundraising, like with sports clubs used today. Spreading the load and having some funding from many. The new generation of land, cares, land carers, so not just young people, but new members of the local community, people that now have more time on their hands. A diversity of land carers, whether it be gender, age or culture. A variety of engagement types. So um, some people are interested in getting together on a working bee on a monthly or a fortnightly basis on a long-term project. Others are more interested in just one-off events. Some people want to get their hands dirty and get involved in weed control or planting or other practices. 
whereas some want to get involved in the communications and the promotion side of things. Data, information, technology, doing it smarter. And markets are starting to demand products from landscapes that are well managed, not degraded by the production of food. So what does Landcare need to do into the future? I believe that Landcare needs to consider what, it's done, what it does well, what it has done well, and what it continues to do well. And focus on this, because it's still needed. Local engagement of people, it's vital. There's always a need for people to connect with each other over common issues and interests. And Landcare provides this and needs to look at do, doing this in different ways as well. There isn't any one size that fits all. Innovation. There is still a lot of experimentation of practices. Pest control methods, application regimes of inputs, robotics and technology, and Landcare continues to play an important role in this. Sharing information and experience. A key strength of Landcare has been farmers and others sharing ideas, sharing successes and failures and experience with each other. With a reduction in extension offices and so much information available on the web, Landcare has a real role to help focus on what's been proven to work. Promotion. Landcare needs to continue to promote itself. Although most of the country's population has heard of Landcare, there's a large proportion that doesn't know that it's about more than planting trees. Demonstrating value. What's Landcare delivering that the whole community values? Can Landcare help with safe and sustainable food, adapting to and mitigating climate change, helping with market access and securing regional and national, the regional and national economy, protecting and improving the Great Barrier Reef, improving water quality, etc. The list goes on. These are national and international issues that capture the public's attention. They require large-scale coordination and planning, but they require local action and support to make a difference. Thinking globally but acting locally has always been one of Landcare's strengths. Thank you. <laughs> How am I going to unpack my boomerang bag? There is so much that's just been put on the table there. But I want to, I want to come pretty much immediately to questions, but just one quick thing I couldn't help but go past. When it comes to what Hannah was talking about with uh, urban and rural agrarian training hubs, yeah. in Sydney recently, I don't know if you knew about an old bowling club right in the heart of town at Camperdown. It's been transformed into pocket city farms. And it's a working farm on the two bowling greens. That's, that's an example of a working educational facility, facility right in the heart of town. I don't know if anyone's heard of Bingra in northern New South Wales. Anyone know Bingra? Yeah. <laughs> now, Bingra has the most incredible outdoor classroom where they are looking at the things you were talking about, Hannah, in terms of broadacre agricultural design. And they're looking at water control mechanisms, illustrating the use of swales, illustrating key line, illustrating chinumpas and the, and the growth of food on water. They've got an educational um, facility there. They've got um, overnight accommodation, so classes can come up there. The beauty is the more we all know about these places, then the more we can start to replicate them. And when we talk about, about groups, I was at Bush Care's Major Day Out two weekends ago. And this was right in the heart of Western Sydney, and there was a ridgetop park. And when we talk about change, this opportunity to shed that skin and say, well, it wasn't like, oh, come and do some land care. Here's a, here's a planter, and here's some tubes. And like 10 minutes after that, people's attention span is gone. They had the, they'd collaborated with the council. They had a stand there. They were giving out plants. They were explaining plants. They had brochures. They had information. But what's more, they had a group of fully clad sulphur-crested cockatoos, these wonderful, beautifully made outfits on humans. They were, they were huge, plus a, 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 a rainbow lorikeet. And they were going around so that as people were planting, they were saying, do you realise that that plant called the whatever it was brings insects for me to eat? And then they got a bird over there and we went for a walk through the native corridor. 
Then they had someone with the animals there illustrating the logs. So what, what am I saying? We need to bring in all these groups and add them to any projects that we do. So whether that's Earth Hour, whether that's Neighbour Day, whether that's Take Three for the Sea, that's where young people are going. Let's go to them and join up with these groups. So does anyone want to add anything to that before we go to the crowd? We're in the process, Costa, of putting our biodiversity strategy together for, for Victoria. We're in the final stages of that. And the two ideas in that are, first of all, you have to reconnect people with nature. And the second proposition in that is we need to manage our natural environment to get better outcomes. So the first bit is the bit that is the most challenging. How do you get people to reconnect with nature? And it is through horticulture, it's through gardening clubs, it's through the volunteer sector, it's through a whole lot of other educational devices, it's through getting people to do stuff in their very localised level, whether it's through clean-up days or, or other things that people can do. That's been a challenge for us to come to grips with uh, as basic a proposition as that sounds. We have over... Uh, we've, we've, we've turned biodiversity conservation in a, in, into a bureaucratic and technological pastime and we're trying to pull it back into being a basic proposition of people getting into connection with nature. And at the World Conservation Congress, it was pretty much the jury is now completely out on this, that the, that the whole uh, future of, of the human uh, and uh, natural environment has to be one that is achieved together. And human health, human well-being and happiness is, is absolutely intrinsically linked to the health and well-being of our environment. And that's what we have to achieve. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, Costa, um, you know, we, we're also doing our national biodiversity strategy and that's exactly the conversation. It's about how you reconnect people in the dialogue, um, how you make it meaningful. Use the word nature as opposed to something else that's Bio got five, whatever, yeah. five syllables in it. Um, yeah. and, and actually, one of, the, one of the initiatives that we've got um, that we're utilising and, and still learning a lot from is the Threatened Species Commissioner. Some of you probably know Gregory Andrews, yep. the Threatened Species Commissioner. He's in my area. Um, who constant, he, he frequently turns up in a bilby suit. Um, to, 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 we Actually, um, I should make a plug. There's a, a fundraising activity that he's got going on at the moment. And um, I think the challenge at the moment is whether he dyes his hair pink and puts a mohawk on or has to do a run around the lake in a bilby suit, depending on how much money he raises. So um, get, on, get onto his Facebook page and have a look. But um, yeah, it's, it's great. And I actually think Sunriser got on, got on, the, on the game. So there's a big challenge there. Um, I'm making a plug for the bilby suit, but I might lose out to the mohawk. Um, but Gregory has done an incredible job at connecting with people and having that conversation about nature and about issues. Um, and I'm going to raise the feral cat issue here. You know, we've, we've, our government has a big initiative about um, dealing with feral cats. It's a big problem, um, a really big problem. Thank you. Um, and, and Gregory, Gregory, through his Facebook and, and Twitter um, accounts and through his public appearances, has been having some really, really challenging conversations about that. Um, you know, we know what happens um, to Australia's nature and what's happening to our wonderful, wonderful animals when, um, because of the number of feral cats that we've got out there. Um, but we've also have, um, you know, they're part of our cats are also part of our lifestyle and part of our, you know, part of our. Um, we have them as pets, as we as we have our dogs as pets and other animals, and and that's created a really um, challenging conversation. Um, Gregory's had both some wonderful compliments and some um, very um, challenging conversations to have. The thing that I want to make, the point that I want to make is that he's been able to use social media and his engagement, which is challenging for bureaucrats, let me say. We're not good at putting ourselves out there and being, you know, human. We've got to say, no, no, we need to support the minister and we need to support the government of the day. But Gregory has actually been able to open up a very active and real and unfiltered policy conversation with the public, anybody who wants to engage at all levels of, of sense and feeling um, on the feral cat issue. And it's been remarkable for me to see the level of engagement. He's got letters from Bridget Bardot, 
right? <laughs> um, it's worldwide. He's been written up in the New York Times. For something like that, that is using social media that gets that broad um, and, and gets that, that level of engagement is quite exciting, which means it's, it's meaningful. The trick, though, is to make it real time. So the other thing that bureaucrats are not good at doing is being really fast and agile and flexible. We're getting better. We you know we need me. to do it. I'm looking at my bureaucrat <laughs> colleagues, but they're shaking their heads, so maybe it's just me. Um, <laughs> Gregory has real-time conversations with people in his social media accounts, and that's a real investment. We're better at sitting behind computer screens and, and typing letter responses that get filtered up through senior people and off by ministers, and then you get a standard response. But Gregory has real-time conversations with people. And I think that's also been a real trick about engaging. So if you're going to use social media and you're going to use these methods, you have to use them in a very real way. There's no point having it there and letting it sit and then taking three weeks to answer it, or a week. Even a day can be too long sometimes. It has to be a real conversation. It has to be in real language, um, words of less than five syllables, um, and it has to be meaningful and, 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 and have courage to address the issues. Yeah, I, um, I actually have a character called Cost of the Garden Name. And I was asked on radio one day, as I was coming in to be interviewed, they said, oh, and we've got Costa coming up next from Gardening Australia, and he's dressed as a garden gnome. And I said, no, <laughs> I am a garden gnome. <laughs> and that's the difference. You have to be, and you have to be present. And when I am the garden gnome, well, I am the garden gnome. I could have bought my outfit. It wouldn't have made no difference. I would have got up here and delivered what I had to deliver because when you believe it, it is you and it just oozes out. So, so yeah, use these, use these mediums to get your message out there. I think that's the point that's coming across loud and clear from our panel. So can we throw it open? Have we got uh, a question or 15 from the crowd? <coughs> right down the front here, and then we'll go up to you two. Uh, thank you very much. And my question is actually addressed to Paul Smith. I found your summary of the propositions over the last 30 years, the development of them, very interesting and very informative. But at the end of the day, surely our challenge is, I think we all accept that you need landscape scale, you need economies of scale for policies. But I think we're also all agreed that getting action done in an economic way needs to be devolved almost to the lowest common denominator, and that's the individual. Yeah. And <laughs> I think the thing which is of the greatest interest to the land care movement as to how the land care movement, which is fundamentally volunteers, volunteering their work, often their money, but basically volunteering their work, how they can be connected to the money mm -hmm. that the government recognises must be spent mm -hmm. on the environment and agricultural development, how that linkage can be made to make best use of the volunteer movement. And I'm not sure... <coughs> that in your summary, I get a feel as to whether that is the proposition which government is looking at at the moment. But I think that's the challenge. I, I absolutely think that you're, you're, you're absolutely right there. The, the point I was, I was trying to make um, is that the future for land care is, is not a bureaucratic exercise. It can't be. It shouldn't be. It has to be one that's led by the people in the landscape who are doing the work voluntarily in networks. The point that you're raising there, I think, is an extremely good one, and one that is a challenging thing for, for governments at, at any level of all persuasions to come to grips with, and that is to hand over control, at, whether it's policy control, financial control, whatever other things. Uh, so I would put forward then um, the offer for a conversation going forward about how best do we relinquish control, how do we put the community back in the centre of policy making and how do we put the community back in the centre of decisions over where resources are allocated and what are they best spent on. So that would be a conversation I'd be very keen for us to have because I know that is what the conversation needs to be uh, and it's not a bureaucratic one, it's absolutely getting into 
the community and the department that I work with has had some really hard lessons in recent times about how it hasn't put the community at the centre. We've got to grips with that. We have a community charter that states absolutely that we will put the community of the, in the centre of everything we do. And if it's about making decisions over allocation and money, well, how do we make that happen? So I'd be very pleased to have that discussion. Good response. G'day. Um, I'm Ruben Parker Greer. I'm from the Museum of Old and New Art in Tasmania. We work on a project called 24 Carat Gardens. We work across 12 school communities creating the benchmark, the gold standard, 24 carat, um, for school kitchen gardens in Tasmania. Um, and I'm most interested in food culture, and I want to um, point out two areas that we need to engage with for future direction. So not really a question, but more a uh, discussion point. Um, in agriculture and at the government level, we need to engage with health. This is most important. The greatest preventative health strategy we have as a nation is to supplement our soils. We supplement our soils, we increase our productivity, we reduce our requirements for fertilisers, chemical fertilisers, runoff and chemicals in our food. This is so, so, so important. And then that food, when it goes into our mouths, is nutrient dense. We need to stop measuring food. We need to continue measuring yield per acre, but we need to measure nutrients per acre as well. Because we've, we all know the statistics, over the last 50 to 70 years, our food's gone down to 20% of its nutrient density. We have to engage with this. Land care has a huge role to play here, and we need to have the Minister of Health up there on that panel next year. It's so, 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 so important. I agree with that. Now, now, the government policy level is great, but that doesn't get culture change. And we need that at the community level. School kitchen gardens have been fantastic. And one of the most inspiring things, we're working with Steph Alexander, and her food philosophy, the good food philosophy, she does not lead her conversation with health. She leads it with pleasure, which is just so, so, so important, and it works. It's non-confrontational. We're working in disadvantaged communities in Tasmania, and if we were to lead telling people what to do, it doesn't work. We need to engage with culture, and we need to engage with the pleasure of food. Now, there's a great, um, when we engage with new areas, I think the foodie people need to be here as well. We do not have it. Coming from Mona, um, we have a huge amount of energy in the local food movement in Tasmania, and it's a really powerful body, and we need to be getting the people in the food movement in, Tasma in Tasmania and Australia looking at food quality. It's a great book by Dan Barber called The Third Plate. He went around the world looking for sustainable agriculture, or f the best food that was created by sustainable agriculture and regenerative agriculture. And he's saying that the best food in the world is from the best practices in the world. And, and that's what we need to be doing. And just for some wonderful big picture ideas, imagine Australian sustainable farms, regenerative farms, there's a new studio for MasterChef. You know, <laughs> come on, this is where we need to be. We need to engage at that really high level. And um, Intrepid has a great role to play here, engaging, but the great thing about food is it goes across everything. And I think there was that quote, um, if you eat, you're a farmer, you know? So, mm. Mm. thank you. Okay. So I, I agree with those points and, and at a lot of land care conferences we've had, um, we had Gourmet Farmer here from Tassie to talk at one time and we've had a number of different chefs and like you I've been reading a lot on the nutrition and what, what we need to do to our soils to actually increase the nutrition in our um, food so I, I do agree completely with everything you said and that health needs to be part of this discussion as well. Yeah, yeah Costa. I. I um, you're talking my language. Um, a few of you in this room actually know that my previous um, roles were in health mm -hmm. and they were also, I did prevention, I did food reg um, and a whole range of other things. Um, and while I was at IUCN I had conversations with my Victorian colleagues exactly about this and actually just this week um, I've been having some chats with my ex-health colleagues about this stuff. It's, it's really mm -hmm. important. Yeah. It's something that I need to be able to translate for governments Again, back to that economic you know, proposition, what's the proposition, the pitch that I can make to government? But that doesn't mean that at a bureaucratic mm -hmm. level we can't have that conversation and start making it real, and, and that's something that I definitely have an interest in. So thank you for raising it. Mm. I need you guys to keep raising it too. Mm. Pardon? Do you want to say anything? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, in four and a half minutes, uh, given to present the case for the future of land care. 
it's often hard to encapsulate all the things that you would like to put in there. And I've been a, a firm believer that um, you could argue the case for the health industry to be putting money into land care to improve the social well-being of people because you'd be saving the money at one end of the spectrum and I think we haven't got any evidence to support this but I think over time you would build the case that says an investment in social well-being at that level will cut off a number of the things that end up costing a lot of money down the track. That's the first thing. But if I could say something uh, that I missed also in there, I've made reference to Intrepid because they've sort of awesomed me over the last couple of uh, months since I've got to know Naomi and uh, Megan and more of them the other night. They drink quite well, incidentally. <laughs> uh, there are other organisations in the same space and w how good would it be if those organisations scattered across the nation somehow pulled together into that space. But above that group again, and this is, a, a, I commend the Victorian Government for creating the Landcare Facilitator Initiative. We have facilitators who really bring some very interesting ideas into, new, into the community, particularly for new members. And, uh, one of the beauties of this conference has been the uh, extension, if you like, of the time available for networking between sessions. And there's an enormous amount of networking going out there. And if anyone is interested in this room, I'd, seek, I'd advise you to seek out Sonia Sharkey from Broadford and from the South West Goulburn uh, Landcare Network, who over the last few years has been introducing a, a, a subject called Farm Blitz. Now, Farm Blitz is um, introducing newcomers to the area to all sorts of things which just brings them into the community and it's been a, a great innovation and it's been stolen by many other land care networks so far, so I think that's another bright spot on the horizon. Really bright. Thanks, Terry. Um. Thank you. <coughs> My name's Bill Pickett and I'm a grassroots volunteer for land care, a uh, land carer, and a couple of comments. One is just to follow up the, uh, the health issue. Food would seem to me to be a small part of that. When you look at the evidence of the health benefits of contact with nature mm -hmm. and the incredible work that Parks Victoria did yep. in looking at healthy parks and healthy people. Yep. And there is a GP in Mittagong who prescribes land care working bees for people who have uh, mild... <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I have a question to the panel, but I wanted to first uh, comment that I was disappointed to see the balance of, the, of, of this panel when we're talking about future directions of land care. There's only one land care entity out of the five. And as a land carer, I was disappointed. Um, but I appreciated very much what all of the people said, because I think that putting that all together, there is the elements of, of, of where we should be looking for the future. But from my point of view, the future is in the hands of the grassroots mm -hmm. and the community, as has been said as we had the, the first comment. But two words are important for me in that, and that is the vitality and the resilience of the land care community. I didn't hear those words mentioned. So I would like to ask the panel, each of the panel members what they would see to be the key to maintaining and nurturing the vitality and the resilience of the land care community in all its diversity and variety. Thank you. Well, I'll have a go. Um, one thing we know about natural systems is that the less diverse they are, the weaker they'll be and the less resilient they'll be. And it's not at all any different when we get to talk about social systems. Mm. And so to be resilient and have vitality, the renewal side of things is very much a critical part of that. The comments I made earlier about diversification is, is my language for what you're talking about there is how do we get more resilience into our social fabric and that is by embracing the diversity that is among us and if we just 
talk to ourselves all the time and you know we'll turn up at a conference like this in a few years and if we're all looking at the same people then I do think we're kind of on a track to failure to be frank with you. I think we need to get a whole lot more diversity into the space and have different faces and people with different names and different backgrounds and I think that reflecting the society that we actually serve is going to be a big challenge, but it's the one that's going to get us where we need to be. That's just a personal view, but I, I would offer that um, very sincerely as my opinion, that that is the pathway for future success. And I'd just like to point out um, the collaboration element of being, uh, being resilient. And so while some of us are not particularly inland care uh, strictly, we're very much in that movement and we collaborate regularly to bring that vitality and build that resilience so we can have that really strong network in our regions mm. and we can draw on each other constantly. And so we might not strictly work in the same uh, space all the time, but we are very much on the same journey together. And that's the strength of diversity and the incredible resilience that we can build uh, through collaboration. So that's, I really think that's quite important, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, I just had a thought, that tree that Don showed us on his um, property that's hollowed out, in a sense, I think we could relate to some of that and say there may well be some groups that shift and the structure remains, the presence and the history remains, but by becoming a hollow, it becomes a home for the new. Nice analogy. Take, take that where you like. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, name, we've got a question here and then down the front. Oh. Hi. My name's Hi. Amber Croft. I'm from North East Victoria. Um, I'm, I guess, of a demographic that doesn't, hasn't really seemed to have been mentioned. There seems to have been lots of mention of um, the need to engage youth in land care and... Um, and, I, and I absolutely agree, that's fantastic. You know, I'm middle-aged, um, I have kids, and, you know, my life's really busy. I work, um, my partner works, we run our kids around to swimming lessons and karate lessons and whatever. And what I do in my spare time, you know, it does need to be about pleasure. And, you know, people of my demographic, you know, we, we want to learn things and do things to improve our local environment. Um, and we absolutely want our kids to have that connection with nature, but you know the, the sort of the, the the standard model of land care groups just doesn't work. And you know I've been on the committee of various land care groups in places where I've lived, and gradually worked out it just doesn't work for me. Um, you know I don't want that pressure of having to go to meetings. I don't want to be talking to being the secretary of a group. Um, but I, I want to be out there doing things and learning from other people and connecting. And, and I want, you know, my little five acre lifestyle property, I want it to be weed free. I want it to have biodiversity values. I want it to be productive. So I think there's real opportunities there. Um, and, and probably to learn from some of the things from the intrepid land care movement um, about, you know, different ways of communicating and um, running events that, you know, might engage that sort of middle-aged demographic. Mm. I was just wondering if any of the panel had thoughts about mm. that. Yes. Mm. Thank you for the question. And you um, identify that land care is a very structured in, in the way it deals with its meetings and things like that. I would argue differently, but probably because we took a different approach when I was president of our local land care group for 15 or 17 years, and that's succession planning, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we, we determined early that people were becoming meetinged out. There are so many other demands on people's time and everything else, so uh, after the first annual general meeting that I was elected, we created an executive, which happened to be 22 strong uh, in number, and the executive did the meetings and disseminated the information to the 66 families that we've now become in our land care group. And that's prevailed for the last 15 or 18 years now, and it seems to work very well because it takes the pressure off people like you, and it enables those who have more time to 
uh, meet and make the direction for the, for the Landcare Group. So the only meetings that our Landcare Group has is on our days when we're either planting trees or bird counting or fencing along the uh, King Parrot Creek or revegetating along the King Parrot Creek, uh, the riparian zones which we consider so important and the main focus of our Landcare Group. So there are, uh, we shouldn't be locked into this hard and fast, must have a meeting every month or anything like that. Our, pres our, our current president um, ad addressed our, or reported to our last AGM, attended by 55 people, a fully catered meal funded by our funds, which we raised, a sit down meal, but he observed that he'd been as president uh, in another capacity to three other annual general meetings at which the maximum number of anybody present was nine. And he was contrasting that with what we've been able to achieve over the years. So without wanting to build the Strath Creek Landcare Group up as a model, if anyone wanted to investigate it, I'd encourage you to do so because I think it's, it's a fresh and different approach to the way we manage land care. Bloody hell, we've got so many meetings, haven't we? Yeah, we do, we do. And it was a really good point, Amber, and, and like Terry, I've heard of a number of land care groups that um, try and use their executive to do some of the work and organise some events and then use social media to invite people just to come for those four, day, four hours, I mean, on a weekend, for example, and then have a barbie or something afterwards, trying to make it easier for people to volunteer and not needing to meet on a regular basis. And I think sometimes this is where, um, where we're able to have some um, land care facilitators. They can help organising these things. So both um, Victoria and New South Wales have invested in a lot of local facilitators and we have um, regional land care facilitators and I think possibly they can help with some of these things that need to move forward as well. Mm. Uh, John Ryan, I'm a local land care coordinator Last at Dubbo. One, yeah. I think the, the big elephant in the room is, is the political one okay. and we, we hear all these amazing things and we hear some really good stuff from senior bureaucrats but in the end it doesn't translate to resourcing, proper resourcing for land care. And it concerns me that we don't have a political voice. I don't think we're, we're nearly strong enough. And I think most land carers are, are very nice people who don't think they should get involved in politics. And I think that's a real, I think that's a real problem. The, um, it concerns me because at the, the federal policy level, we're wasting hundreds of millions of dollars. And I'll give you one example. Uh, a bloke in Western New South Wales got $14 million to not clear invasive native scrub from his property. And the, the people who organised that, who cherry-picked that project and designed it, got, four to, uh, got $8 million of the 14. But the bloke who got $6 million didn't care because his property was only worth three. I had an argument with Greg Hunt about that and I explained the situation to him. And at the end of that, he said, point taken. But all he needed to do was with the science that they've, um, the science that they can justify, he can stand up in Paris and say, uh, look, you know, we're mitigating, we're mitigating so much um, uh, carbon into the atmosphere. That scrub was never going to be cleared. There was no business case for it because to clear it would cost more than the land was worth. So the best case scenario is we lost $11 million just in one project. That could have set up an industrial hemp industry. And what that could have done is show Australian farmers how to grow something that not only uses, is very light on the environment, but it would put us into the realm of having material for the emerging 3D printing industry, where people can be manufacturing on farms uh, when 3D printers evolve, and our farmers could be out competing China manufacturing wise. So, I think we've got to engage, we've got to become a much stronger group and we've got to get every group under the banner and we've got to push far harder at the political level because we can send all the things through you guys and then if there's a crossbencher who's got to be in their bonnet, that's what they're going to go with. Good point. That's certainly um, something that the National Land Care Panel um, can drive, I, w I would imagine. But uh, any any single comment there from the panel? Did you want to talk? I think. Um, look, no. Uh, <laughs> it's a big one. Chicken. Thank um, 
<laughs> so I'm not being trite, but I agree, point taken. Um, I'm aware of those issues as well. Um, and I think, um, thank you for recognising some of the challenges in translating the messages, um, but I think also part of what I take from what I, I have been hearing about is also a point that was raised earlier, which is the need for bureaucrats and policy makers also to integrate and collaborate across the boundaries. You know, um, as you know, they're two areas in the same portfolio, so that we need to do that better too. Okay, um, we're, we've hit 10.30. <laughs> There's 20 questions. I'm getting evil looks. <laughs> <laughs> I've got eager eyes everywhere. Um, if it's real short. Yeah, it will be really short. <laughs> My comment is just on the, the age that we are in with the handover of farms. The 40, 1940s children now are handing the farms yep. over. Mm. That's where, if Paul was talking about a conversation, we need to have a conversation with the next people that take these farms yep. on. Mm. And we need to make it palatable because I talk to younger farmers and they go, oh, all that environment stuff, it's all, oh, there's so much, I just, it's not palatable. That has to change because as we, we've, we've done 30 here and Landcare is very good at looking back, but I think we do enough of it now. We really have to move forward for this next lot of farm owners, whether it be the younger son or daughter or corporates that are just going to take over big swabs. And my other thing was to the lady up there that said that, you know, she's in that older middle age or <laughs> the bracket, <laughs> is that we've looked at, um, instead of making land care, oh, you have to be a member of land care to be in a project or whatever. I've done projects where we just open huge slabs of land. If you want to be in it, here it is. And, you know, I, I see farmers in tractors and we jump in and we go, and they go I don't want to be a land care, but how about to protect your sheep, we'll put some... Great, we'll do it, done. So that's the way of doing it. Because we hear a lot of talking and conversations and all this stuff. I think we have to look at the next people who are going to own the big lots of land. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was short enough. That, that's a definition of uh, what land carry uh, might be uh, in the eyes of those people, the new people coming onto those farms. It seems to me that um, leaving aside the advantages of the biodiversity plantings and things like that, a, non, a farmer coming onto land would be a fool to do anything else but improve that land to guarantee the productivity that he needs to make a, a success of it. So um, they might be in denial about all that land care stuff, but I would imagine that common sense says that they would be doing what they can to make good value out of the property they're on. Well, the gates of Troy are being pushed. There's lots of questions, and I think that was the whole idea of this panel. We were never going to solve it. We're just putting ideas out there for the next break. So share and, and fertilise those ideas when you head out for your cuppa. Could we please put our hands together for our wonderful panel? Thank you. Terry Hubbard, Hannah Maloney, Paul Smith, Kylie Johnson and Michelle Lauder. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.